Hello. Hello, Oliver and Tom. Hi, Akash. Hi, Tom. Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we have all time zones right now. Hello, Taylor. Hi, Hello, Taylor. Taylor. Hello, Taylor. Good morning. All right. Give it another minute, Tom. Yeah, sure. All right, I guess you can go ahead and get started, Tom. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I've put the link in the chat for people to put their name on the list. Um, so, looking down the events to, to Wednesday, Cloud Native Security Con. Um, do we know where anyone going? Is there any telco, useful telco events to look out for? Do we know? So,
the cloud native topic day cfps are open so definitely um want folks to get those in um while it's still open yeah, when, we'll is that, when do they close february 12th they, they extended it um to the 12th excellent that's good I noticed that cloud native security con doesn't have a, a virtual option, right? So it's mainly presential. Yes, in person only. Okay, well, for the next time. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, there's so many events, hard to keep up with them. It, we did hear that there are going to be, there will be some telco presence there um, from someone this past week, but I'm not going to make it up to that event at this late notice. <clears throat> Maybe we'll, maybe there'll be some good talks and stuff that we can see out of it, though. Cool. Okay. Um, anyone got any topic ideas for the an event DTF? These tend to be about topic, you know, the LFN projects. Um, so obviously they're relevant to Telco. I um, wonder if there's any that we want to um, consider. It's a bit late notice, I know. I wasn't checking before, but I noticed now that these are NAFTA topics, uh, which are great, like uh, this Sandeep and Mar are going to present something. So pretty nice to see some topics called nephew. I mean, besides the other, I mean, to say what? So is one of these ones? Mm. Cool. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that we'd want to add from a CNF working group point of view. Um, I guess we could do a general interest topic thing, but I haven't got the time to think about it at the moment. I mean, um, the, I think the bigger thing for me is that it's so soon and hmm. the deadline was the 27th so we'd have to really have something ready and ask you know ask someone can you get it down at this point yeah um, yeah true yeah deadline's gone isn't it yeah okay that okay. i think it, it would be I mean, there's a, a few things that we could look at, but I think it's probably something for a future one. Um, any type of collaboration, which there's some ongoing talks that have increased recently. And then um, the stuff that we were talking about going up to the end of the year, um, as far as, and then as start of this year for publishing that the dev best practices and you know if we can get maybe have that as a stronger goal with a timeline and then presenting something on that which could include some of the stuff around um, energy the energy focus stuff environment environmental um, things that we're seeing more of and there's post into Slack from the Kubernetes um, 
some of the Kubernetes projects around this. Um, and we did talk about best practices there. So I, th I think there's <clears throat> some possibilities for a future one. Okay. Makes sense. Maybe um, over the next uh, few weeks, we can have some focused talks about how uh, direct specific goals and how we can get there. And those yeah. would be tie into any future at conferences. Okay. Um, we mentioned the Cloudmates Telco Day. Anything else anyone wants to call out or something we should submit a talk for? This, uh, this CFP closes soon, the Open Source Summit in North America. Don't know if anyone's planning on attending. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I'd like to know how um, t Tom, you and Victor think about the open source side. We talk about the cloud native a lot. The open source is, you know, underlying a lot of the pieces. <clears throat> When I'm in conversations with different orgs and trying to get collaboration, a lot of times one of the initial things is we, our products are not open source or we're having to work with non-open source products if it's a consumer of a, those products. So for Open Source Summit, it seems like we should have a slant where it would be more have highlighting more about open source and at least in my brain when I'm thinking about it. But what do y'all uh, think? Is, so I agree. I I think I think there's pl there's plenty that could be said about the benefits of open source to telcos. Um. I think if you were going to do if, if someone was going to do a talk on that, you'd have to address the elephant in the room, um, which seem, seems to me to be the elephant in the room, which is the the patent problem that telcos are reliant on. Telcos and telco vendors are reliant on patent revenue, and that kind of goes against the grain of open source licensing and open source project management. Um, that it, that's true to an, an extent. Um, there's two paths when it, that come to mind thinking about that. One is um, a little bit easier, I think, for to talk with folks about. Um, not not focusing on what you are doing with your product or how your business works specifically and and then more focusing on what your business is built on and what your products are built on and i would without you know this is just me throwing something out my own opinion but i would i would bet that most products out there are using some open source, if not a large amount of open source libraries and everything else. Besides, <clears throat> if you're running on Kubernetes, then especially if you're doing like something where it also provides a platform type thing. But if you're providing like operators, you may be using some operator framework, but you're using specific pieces. And that's without looking at containers running on something and um, dbdk you know for instance well lots of um cnfs that are dealing with the uh, user plane are using dbdk and uh, you just keep going down that path so you talk about how open source has provided a lot of benefits and i don't know you could talk about that and i i think it for some companies are more engaged with 
the whole open source community so it's not just a technology and there may be feedback you know and user stories and stuff like that so in my mind that's kind of an easier path because you're getting more people to talk about open source and how they're involved even if their product is an open source and then the other side would be talking about um different models for what does it mean if you have an open source um, product how how do you deal with that and there's a lot of examples of of those including like if you just looked at cncf then a a lot of the projects i'm not gonna say all of them but a lot of them there is a commercial version of that project where they may call it enterprise or whatever else they call it could be a hosted type of service or a, a version that has more plugins that they have but the core would be open source so and that's just one path there's a lot of paths for that so i think there's an opportunity there that similar to cloud native a lot of other domains have learned what what does it mean and how to work within you know how, how do you work within the whole how do you actually adopt open source um ideals and that are beneficial you know because this goes back to like bsd and and stuff which would be research and science and sh sharing does it benefit us more i think that telecom world is still can um, benefit from that similar to cloud native. I'm just not sure how to approach it into for telecom because it's a little bit different. Like how do you translate and show like the benefits of the adoption? Yeah, it's tricky because there's two, there's, well, there's more than two sides to it, isn't there? There's the there's the use of open source kind of within your core infrastructure that is being used to deliver products. Um, but there's also the use of open source in the products that you sell directly to consumer or business customers. So, you know, what are the degrees of separation between the thing you're selling and the open source project? Um, and I think the, the, the more degrees there are, certainly I found the more likelihood you're gonna end up with the, the patent discussion um, being had. But I, 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 think, I think it's a good idea. I think there's plenty of discussion to have, be had, plenty of talk material um, on, the, on the topic of open source and telco. So I'm interested in the topic. I'm wondering how that ties back to uh, if there's a, we're, we're talking about open source summit and a CFP. So is it something that we want to do as CNF working group? And that's separate from you and I, Tom go, hey, this is interesting. Let's go do a talk at open source summit, just completely separate. That's, you know, it could be open source telecom. Does that, is that good enough? to say that's related to the CNF working group, we're also interested. I'm just seeing how to tie it all together because we all have limited time. Mm. <clears throat> Long-term, I think it benefits what we're doing. I mean, we're, you know, the CNF working group is definitely engaged in open source projects. So that's like, there's something there. I'm just not thinking of, a more direct uh i'm not making a more direct connection right now in my head so <clears throat> let's see um february 5th so that's this sunday mm -hmm. yes yeah um does anyone else have any thoughts like how would we because you know if if we're going to put time into submitting on, on cfp um if we have an idea and we just want to submit something fine but um 
and then we can always decline later, but I don't have something just ready. But otherwise, we need to decide on something and we think, yeah, this is beneficial and maybe it ties back to what we're doing. Well, uh, in, in my case, my only experience attending this uh, open source event is um, in Austin. And one of the things that I noticed is uh, mainly two things. Uh, most of the sessions are very technical. Like they were trying to explain some complexities of the technology. And the other thing is like, um, uh, I feel like most of the attendees were looking for places to innovate, like uh, some looking for some fresh ideas or things like that. So maybe, I don't know if that, that was my impression. So probably, uh, I don't know if we, we can provide something like who could meet those criteria. Like, uh, I don't know, probably explain a little more like, um, the test suite tool, like how it works internally, or like some of the benefits, or um, I don't know. Uh, that could be a suggestion, but I don't know if that is, could be also aligned what you were saying before. So a a kind of a slightly less technical talk about the benefits of open source in telco is less likely to go down well, but a, a more technical deep dive into an open source project that's relevant to telco might be more successful. So I've understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just would maybe on that same topic, um, and I know this wasn't necessarily the ask, but I, it feels like the, the, there are a couple different angles. I mean, you can take the angle of sort of the benefits of using open source uh, and the test suite being an example of that, right? Um, uh, in, in, with the purpose of helping to drive uh, cloud native adoption. Um, you can make me, so depending on which forum, right? Which, you know, I was thinking you asked earlier um, and I think there was a comment, uh, Taylor, I think you put it on um, the D DNTF, you know, for example, if you scroll up just a little bit, I think that was, I'm trying to look, see this on the, on the screen here. Um, yeah, that we had, you know, topic submission. Um, you know, it's too, it's too late. We, that's why I didn't make a mention of it, but otherwise I would have thought that would have been a possible area. Um, certainly since there are, it's early days, but there are some conversations on um, doing collaboration around, again, open source tool, using it across, you know, open source organizations. Um, that, that, that would be another angle as well. So I guess we were mainly focused on the open source part though, which was, which, um, that one's, maybe we have time for that, uh, that we won't have a time for the LFN D, D and T F this time around, but maybe one of the future ones. That confuse mm -hmm. everybody. <laughs> no, that's, I'm, 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 I'm taking that into consideration with what Victor had said, yeah. and um, I think it's maybe similar to the higher level um, thing that Tom was talking about. And if if we can't find, if we don't think there's going to be a a good audience for what we're presenting then we can spend our time elsewhere that's it we don't have i'd love to visit vancouver again <laughs> but yeah. um i think that we should uh respect our time and and you know know that we're only going to have so much time so if i'm willing to have a follow-up Call. I don't want to take the whole call thinking about open source summit if, if we don't have anything, but if, if we think that there might be something to focus on, um, then we could do that. Um, as far as the test suite at open source, maybe, uh, it does give the opportunity to talk about 
collaboration with other orgs, Oliver. So that could be like just one part of it, used in certification and built on open source and using a lot of open source projects, to different tools. And so there's potential for that sort of thing to be part of it. Um, and I think that's an okay fit for open source summit, potentially, like pitching it and why are you gonna pitch it there? Maybe as a, a testing tool that could be you know, used by other developers and um, ops folks and whatever else, and then just the benefit of collaboration groups. So I see something there. Um, I'm, I'm not tying it back to why we would do it as, as CNF, you know, working group folks and, and how that relates back to telco. So maybe let's table it unless y'all have some ideas like more, and if you want to continue, that's fine, but give the opportunity to move on. And if we table it, but we're having some ideas in the back of our head, either on that, what you put forward, Victor, or something else, I'm willing to set some time for this. I mean, I, I do think that we need to set some specific goals and try to push for more involvement with the working group and push more of like, how do we get people engaged in cloud native and open source telecom and the benefits of those things. Uh, CICD and a lot of these things are driven by the efforts in open source. So a lot of it's just like, what are you missing in methodology and thinking of sol problem solving? Um, anyways. What, what do y'all think? Table it and come back? I, I think so. I, I don't think it's feasible to do something by Sunday. Yeah. Well, I will. I'm going to just set some time on my calendar. And if anyone um, wants, thinks of something, then <laughs> just message me and I'll uh, make some time this week. And if we're like, nope, we have an idea, let's go forward, then let's do that. Okay, sounds good. Yep, agreed. All right. Do, does anyone know about that big five event in Austin? Any of y'all attending or know anyone attending? Um, I won't be attending, and I'm not, I've not come across it before. All right. Looks like it's specific to North America, maybe. Or focused on North America, rather. Um, which isn't a, a positive or a negative, it's just a, a thought. What about the Open RAN Summit? I think that may be Telcom TV. Huh. Oh, what you were there. Go a little bit down. Right there. Open RAN Summit Telecom TV. I think that's what that is. Let's see if the dates match. Yeah.
Um, possibly. Um, focuses on total cost of ownership, SI models, development of stable and reliable RIP. Developer ecosystem. So maybe if there's something we've got that's relevant to the RIC developer ecosystem, it could fit into the the agenda they've got. Certainly, my my experience of watching those things before is that they are not very technical. I don't know if anyone else agrees. They get a lot of folks joining. I've seen that even the in person too, filling up a room. Um, but it seems like the conversations or topics are pretty set by the time you're seeing anything. Yeah, and and it's often it's often either this kind of interview, it's this interview format rather than a, mm -hmm. you know, someone giving a decent chat. Okay. Um, I mean, Open Source Summit Europe, we can, we've just spoken about, I think we've got more time to prepare for something for that. Yeah, that would be maybe a more possibility as far as timeline goes for that yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we move on to the reviewing the PRs and the issues? Yeah. And if we have any topics that come up, we can start looking for a conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be well, safe. I mean, that's, a good, that's a good way of doing it is, you know, people have a, a kind of a blueprint for a talk they want to give on something relevant to the CNF working group. It's, that's a nice way of doing it because then it's, it's ready for when a suitable conference comes around. So maybe, maybe we should do that anyway. So put together yeah. a couple of, couple of talk options. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm sure if, um, if we start working on the options, then we'll be able to find some somewhere to talk. There's a lot of places. Right, PR review, uh, not open at the moment. There was one closed in the week, which was oh, the issue template. Okay, that's cool. So now that means if you want a new issue, you can either report vulnerability, which I didn't know about. Um, you can open a blank issue or you can create a best practice proposal. Um, and so when we've got these text boxes to be able to put in the different sections of the best practice proposal and do one or all of those, or one or more. Really. So that might help, we'll see. Um, so, um, reviewing the issues. Let's go from the bottom up. Do not want containers with a privileged flag. So it's included in the CNF certification as an essential test. Um, Currently assigned to Taylor and Victor with a milestone of this quarter, so by the end of March. Yeah, we need to work on that proposal. I mean, so it's just a matter of uh, putting all the all, all the things that we have in a PR. Cool. I'm going to uh, send you a calendar invite, Victor. 
Okay. I've, I've been a little unavailable for at least half of January. So I'm just trying to catch up. I will, I'm going to send out a few and you just let me know which one works. Okay. Okay, uh, requirements for multi-interface on hold. Any reasons to bring that off hold? No, well, probably related with the same PR. Uh, well, same issue is like uh, the, the parallel effort that the current committee is doing. Uh, just put some of the latest things that they were discussing about uh, naming. Um, so I think that they are going to send a survey based on the number of proposals. So they have narrowed down a few of them. So if you are able to, to vote, maybe you can choose your ref uh, option. And they try to summarize the, the, the intent or like the goal for, for that new uh, Kubernetes resource. So this is going to be just an API object and Kubernetes representing the connection of the pods. So. so the namings are? Yeah, Kinate, uh, KTSNet, uh, Pod Network, Connectivity Provider, Connectivity Service, and Network Instance. And this is a name for an API object in Kubernetes representing a network to which pod can attach to. And this object can be referenced by other API objects, e.g. service. Yeah, the, idea being, to... the idea being that a pod can have multiple attachments to different networks or different API objects of this type. In fact, exactly. they tried to just get all the, the idea in one single sentence. Um, one of the criteria to choose this name could be like uh, in the semantics of the, for example, if you use kubectl, like kubectl get both networks, sounds like a yeah. something yeah. easy to understand. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the pool are going to be open to anyone or they're just going to send it to the mailing list. The, for what the name yeah for the name yeah i'm not as worried about the name as if if it actually has the functionality that um we've been hearing and talking and complaining about for years now is it covering is it covering some of the main stuff Is network service mesh folks, are they saying this? Uh, good question. I think so. Yeah, I I mean, I haven't been attending those calls for a while, so I'm not, I don't know if it's been a current topic. I haven't seen it when I'm, just looking at the network service mesh meetup now meeting notes. The last time that I mentioned these two F uh uh, he mentioned like was during the uh, last KubeCon and he was saying like he didn't see any point to this effort like uh, yeah because uh, I think that this this is this one this is not the first intent that they're trying to do in terms of, like uh, offering multi multi network so and given that they have found like a, another way to mitigate this, this problem. Like uh, he didn't see any, any particular advantage to keep doing the, all these things. But that was the opinion of that.
Interesting. Okay. Need to have a read through this. So when are the calls for this? Uh, Wednesday, 8 a.m. PST. Is that for Europe? I, I think that they are recording the, 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 the meetings. They switch from Google Meet to uh, Linux Foundation Zoom meeting platform. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if probably, I don't know if that was recorded, but they usually try to record the session. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so that's relating to this issue, which will remain on hold for now. Quite a link to non root and non root. Oh, I just need to get on with that. I'm going to prefer that some time. Refactor introduction final paragraph in the first section. Okay, um, no one assigned to that yet. If anyone wants to work on that, please go ahead and assign yourself and create a PR. Uh, same for these next two. Yeah. Right, so this one, um, one process type. So there was a bit of dispute from Goge, who then hasn't followed up to the follow up. No. I know um, uh, Watson is going to be talking with Ger or plans to talk with Goge, I think, this week. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't know if I'd put it in there, but um, he's he's going to be talking with them some, but they've been working on more write up about related items that would tie into this. And I think there's a microservice white paper that is being um, edited right now. So that'll have a lot more content about this, and we'd probably point to that as a reference and have further discussion. Ideally, though, if you know this is going to be something proposed, and there's Gerge actually even open a pull request to just remove it from the test suite as a a main essential test or something. I, I can't remember. That's outside of the working group. But okay. um, I, bef ideally, you know, we can get Gerge on here to go in and, and provide, um, you know, here's alternatives and other stuff. Uh, I do want to like bring up on the call, <laughs> and this is recorded. So, have it like that, that we're trying to create guidelines for what we think is the best path to follow for most cases, not all cases. So the idea with any of these, like the privilege flag and all these other stuff, or most of the time you should try to do these things. But when there's times where you shouldn't, then that's okay. And the way that we've been writing up the best practices communicate that, including caveats that you're going to run into if you don't do this, um, alternatives, any, anything like that. So if there's a dissenting view that we think is important to highlight, then that can go right into a best practice if we think that it's you know a best practice that should be followed in most cases. Um, and this particular one is related to how you would be utilizing microservices normally, which would tie into 
I think a lot of the best practices and cloud native practices that you would be following. That's that's why it's being put forward. It's tied into a lot of things. So we I think we need to have more context given from it, any um, other views and then make decisions on, does it go into the caveats area, options area? Does it mean that we don't wanna put it forward as a best practice? There's a lot of things there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the other thing, Taylor, I don't know if you remember, like last, last time we were talking about this and that also brought the, the topic about um, having, using, what was the name, uh, container, no, process handler in the, in the, in the because the, the, the container requires to manage the, the signaling properly. Uh, it, that brought the, 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 the concern about like doing in the right way, which was related with the topic, but not directly tied to the one process per, um, per container. So we were also talking about like, okay, let's in, in somehow simplify the things that made the best practice quite simple, but also cover a lot of similar ideas around this, this, this problem. Um, do you remember like that particular topic about um, managing signals properly? Taylor? Man managing the sign-offs? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember like when I was answering to, to Gregory? Um, so one of the topics that I found was uh, related to, to the most of the cases, like, I mean, you can definitely, you can manage multiple processes per container. But one of the major problems is like, if, if you are not propagating those signals to, to the container manager, uh, you, you get a problem so and, and they were suggesting some articles were suggesting to use other tools in the docker entry point to yeah propagate those things i mean it was related with the, the the one process per container probably but also it was another kind of best practice for that the, for the docker create the container creation so eventually we follow the similar pattern, like like digging more things and eventually we will proliferate in a lot of best practices with the similar topics. Yeah, I, well, I mean, if um, is we probably should just start coming up with a list of those either as they can go in as issues or into the discussion forum for those ideas. Um, one of the, th the things that we talked, I think we talked about a little bit was you can have zombie processes and other stuff. And so you can start looking into process managers and there's software out there that does pretty good management. I think I may have already mentioned um, the like email systems. So QML, I think was one of the big examples of separation of um, concerns implemented in um, processes that are running and actually isolating them under different users and stuff. So if anything was, uh, if any one of them had a problem, including like external security issues and and post fix which was a a rewrite of that by someone from ibm those are two large mail i think if if you're into email at all as far as the systems then most people think send mail and but qmail and and post fix would be the ones that they actually handle 
larger quantities, like if we look at growth. And they were both, PostFix was designed like QML to run in different processes. And those are internal versus saying, using a in it, um, what is your in it process manager? And there are those as well, but you can actually build a system that does process handling. And if you look at languages like Erlang, well, it's all about having, it's uh, building applications that have lots and, you know, tens of thousands of processes. It's designed for that and, and separation of those. Using some type of process manager where someone actually already knows what they're doing and you're taking advantage of that is a good path if you haven't already been building systems like PostFix or uh, software. The idea with a best practice of one process type, not multiple processes, but one process type in a container is, is a method of separation similar to what PostFix is doing with multiple concerns broken into processes. They're not containers, they're just processes. Or if you're running something like Erlang and you're having a lot of processes, but each little component may be split off versus saying, I'm going to have one container and run running using a process um, monitor and manager that can run everything, but you end up with lots of process types, uh, which moves you towards, it's an anti-pattern for uh, micro, following a microservice model. And there'd be a lot of different things that you could start pointing out. But this again is more of, is this the path that works for you? Like, do you want to take all the benefits and you have caveats or not? And there, you know, you could definitely have a, a container. I don't want to say a CNF. I'm going to be more specific. You have a single container that has multiple process types and you have a very strong and valid reason for that. But is that the best practice for everybody? That's, that's all we're saying. Like, should most people follow the practice of trying to separate concerns? And that's what each process type is there. You know, I would say probably it's a different concern. It's handling something different. You may have one... I don't even want to say process type because I'm reusing that word. You may have one application running in a container that has multiple processes. That's not what this best practice is about. That's fine. It could be a single process or it could be many, many processes. It's when you have a different process type. So they're doing multiple things. And the best practice is saying, when you have multiple things being handled, multiple services, multiple functionality, you're doing processing different types of things, then the recommendation is to split those and not have them in the same container. Yeah, the other thing that I was thinking is one thing is a process and that thing is the threat. I mean, definitely having multiple threats on a single application is totally fine. Having different process types or like different processes in general to be a kind of a bad practice. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of exceptions like Erlang, which is totally fine because part of the way that Erlang works. Erlang is hard for me to think about in Kubernetes because it's in a lot of ways, um, and, it, and people do write Erlang and Erlang derivative um, applications running on Kubernetes. 
Um, but what's weird for me is Erlang in a lot of ways is designed to work like Kubernetes. Like it is essentially Kubernetes. It has its own um, system for handling restarts and monitoring and all of the, a lot of the stuff that Kubernetes does as a framework. Um, and core applications and Kubernetes to help other applications that you write to work well, and you don't have to think about those things. Erlang plus the, the standard library in Erlang is how they look at it. That core mm -hmm. is designed the same way, but it's also designed to run tens of thousands of processes and um, when you're when you're building an application and it's designed to split them all up but kubernetes is designed to where you're you know you would build lots of containers and they work together you know not i'm running a kubernetes cluster and i have three big applications that are five gigs a pace with massive data sets. That's an unusual uh, case for Kubernetes. Most of the time you're talking about thousands, you know, or people are talking thousands or tens of thousands of containers on running on a cluster. And with Erlang, it's it feels a little weirder to split it out. I'm, I mainly brought it up as an example of that particular programming language you would, if you're, if you're building a container, it feels a little weird to split an Erlang container out. Um, so if, if, you, if you had an Erlang telecom application and you're trying to run it on Kubernetes, I can see how splitting different process types into different containers doesn't make as much sense because you're actually not taking advantage of Erlang. Like the actual system was designed to have really high speed connectivity between essentially its own little mini containers, what would be running on the Erlang VM. But I would count Erlang as a a, a very small subset of applications that are targeting Kubernetes. As far as I know, I'm I'm not hearing about a lot of telecoms that are going, hey, we're trying, we're having trouble. Um, I like the language, but I think for most languages, that's not the case, including like Java, you know, C++, you know, besides you know, and most, most any language that I can think of right now, it's, that's not an issue. Um, just conscious of time. I've got to jump to my next call, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's been quite an interesting and useful discussion. Um, <clears throat> I know it's hard, but if you, if we can summarize some of that in the, in the issue, I think it will help whoever comes to write that. Um, um, I, know we're run, I know we're running over time, but I just want to, uh, it's a comment I think we can address on the next time around on that specific, um, I, I think we're talking about, Taylor, you're talking about it being in some cases, you know, there may be reasons for not doing this, uh, you know, and you're, in other words, you're saying this doesn't necessarily apply to, to everyone, there are caveats, etc. <clears throat> the only thing I think I, that we need to address somewhere in all that is I think people think about the certifications and things like that. And if it's an essential test and you don't do this, then you lower your chances perhaps of, of being able to certify. So I think that needs to just be addressed some way because uh, ultimately we don't want to turn people away well saying, well, if you, if you have a, re a good reason for doing it, go ahead and do that. But that doesn't, you may not get your, you may not be awarded a, 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 uh, a certification if that's something you're trying to do. So anyway, I just, just put that out there for us to yeah. not forget. 
Right now, that's not an issue because it's not a, you must pass 100%. And I know. I know. I know. It comes down to one, that someone doesn't pass, that doesn't mean they don't get certified. So uh, if, if it turns out that we have a large set of things that we're all recommending, these are essential. And then we have the majority of people not being able to get certified. You know, we can think about what does that mean? Um, ideally, <laughs> folks are getting helped and they're becoming more cloud native. That's that's the point in the, the long run. I mean, I, I'm wanting people to do these things because I literally think that it's going to be beneficial. Add, add any comments or notes we can... Um, continue next time. Yeah, brilliant. If Thanks someone all. has ideas for talks, uh, just reach out. Thanks, brilliant. everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye.